Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK, and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. Hi everybody, Michael Horn here one more time speaking about the Billy Meyer UFO case, what I consider to be the most important story in all of human history. And when I make statements like that, which sound somewhat grandiose, obviously, it begs the question, well, what do you base that on? Why do you think that that's the most important story in all of human history? Well, how about this? We want to, and I might, have, I might have mentioned this on a previous show before, but we want to always think about when we, we, we kind of create a menu for you know, our priorities in life and, and list those things in you know, descending order from the top down. The first thing would be the most important, and the bottom, of course, would be the least important. So what criteria do reasonable people use to determine the truth? And that means the truth about anything. When we're going to start to speak about something like UFOs, there is a kind of uh, a frequency, a vibration that floats across uh, and it hits people in different ways. Obviously, some people think that this is the weirdest, m most, you know, out there topic of all. Other people on the other end of the spectrum accept virtually any and everything about this topic as being factual and true and uh, completely unworthy of critical thinking, uh, of logic, of scientific process. And in between, there are people that find this simply as entertaining or amusing, interesting, and of course, you've got, you know, back all the way up to people that have a very, very high, uh, you know, sense of standards and criteria for determining what's true. In the overall field of UFO, in this topic, there's been a lot of contentiousness, a lot of disagreement and argument, and I've considered uh, my contribution to it to be nothing short of um, huge, uh, because I feel it's important to not be stuck on either of those spectrums of indifference uh, to, you know, to outright dismissal of the topic and to that other vague area of accepting everything is true because it's under the banner of ufology or UFOs. So in starting to look at this and this idea of the criteria and looking at the conflict and the contentiousness and all, if we start to sift this a bit, we say, well, why is there such a you know, wide variety of opinion and reactions to this, even in what's called uh, the UFO community, which I also often call the UFO industry because it has turned into an enormously lucrative occupation for many people. I wish I could say I was really among them, but I'm not quite there. Um, by that industry and those people, I mean the people that are uh, putting up very fancy websites and hosting big conferences to which the same speakers generally are invited to present the same inconclusive presentations, arguments, and I'll use this term advisedly, evidence to make their case. So we have this whole scattershot, this whole throw it up against the wall and see if it sticks. 
And then people like me who become very contentious and argumentative and specific, we're hammering away at something here, and there's a reason for it. Here's the reason. We've got this umbrella of, you know, what criteria do reasonable people use to determine the truth? Now we come to the question, well, if there really are extraterrestrials in their craft and their UFOs flying around, what would be the reason for it? So we're, we're going to try to fill in somewhere in between there. What's the criteria? If we can establish, you know, a credible reality that, oh, wow, there really are other beings in the universe, they've showed up or they're still showing up or what have you, let alone that there's one man on Earth who is in contact, ongoing contact with these extraterrestrial human beings. Now that's quite a lot to consider, so let's drink to it for a moment. So, one of the things that has happened over the past at least dozen years that I've been very active uh, online and in person and interviews and what have you, uh, taking the fight, so to speak, to the, not just to the skeptics and scientists, but to the biggest opponents of the Billy Meyer case, the UFO community. They're right in there believing any and everything without evidence, as far as I'm concerned. But when it comes to this evidence-rich Billy Meyer UFO case, which has been ongoing for more than 72 years, they just don't know what to do except attack it. It can't be true. It can't be real. So we've got to go back to our criteria thing. Now, while I have been doing that, and while I can do it, and I continue to do it, I wanted to bridge the gap between me, my representation of the Meyer case, and some of the so-called official parties out there that are, you know, at the forefront of ufology, the UFO uh, community, UFO industry, and some of those entities I've listed as MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, which has been in existence for 45 years, and uh, newer entities such as Exopolitics, a completely imaginary and delusional concept that uh, there's some kind of political reality that has to be dealt with pertaining to extraterrestrials who will get into it but aren't dealing in politics and don't want to have any part of our insane politics. There's an organization called the Disclosure Project, which started off as a really good idea and seems, in my opinion, to have been co-opted into a nothing short of hucksterism and nonsense. You can pay lots of money to run out into the desert with Stephen Greer and people shine your flashlights in the sky and try and get aliens to perform on demand for you. That's what that, that has degenerated to. Uh, in addition to trying to raise, continually raise lots of money from us good folks for so-called free energy projects which never seem to manifest despite huge amounts of money being raised and invested. All of this is actually part of this whole, what's the criteria? What do reasonable people use as their criteria to determine the truth? And then you get to an organization like Open Minds, which has puts on conferences and has websites and magazines and does everything in its power to put out disinformation, distraction. This organization bought up the all the research material could get its hands on from the late uh, Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens, who was the lead investigator in the Billy Meyer case, they bought all this stuff up, and then they attack it as a hoax, the Meyer case, and then they sell his photographs to make a profit. This is what we're dealing with. So if you don't think that this whole UFO thing is, is screwy beyond belief, let me tell you, it is. Now, I mentioned MUFON at the beginning of that list. And I've had plenty of issues with this organization. Uh, their existence was foretold to Meyer in 1953 by his second contact person, Asket. She told him that this organization would come into existence and that it would be an opponent of his. It would be very difficult for him. Sixteen years later, in 1969, MUFON indeed was formed and started to investigate UFO cases. And Meyer 
had gone public for the first time in India in 1964. And all these things, we have links we'll make available to you on the website and, and on, on our videos and what have you. You'll be able to examine all, all this evidence, all that I'm pointing to, and you can do it for free, of course. It's all posted there. Now, in 1964, while Meyer first went public with everything about his experiences to that time, UFO photos, particularly from in some amazing photos, it didn't gain, you know, gain wide uh, coverage in the in the uh, global press. Starting in 1975, when Meyer had his first official contacts, uh, which were intended to be broadly publicized, and have been since that time. Meyer started to gain some recognition in the world, primarily originally in Europe, then slowly in Asia, eventually in the U.S., and so it's now spread, you know, internationally to virtually every country on earth. There is awareness of the Meyer case. There isn't unanimous, you know, uh, decision as to its authenticity among many people, and we're going to try and work with that. Now. With MUFON, I have been highly critical of their avoidance of seriously investigating the Meyer case. Uh, if you do an internet search on that, you'll find that I have all sorts of articles and blogs trying to get them to, you know, answer the door, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Recently, there was a breakthrough, and that breakthrough was in the form of communication from the actual executive director of MUFON, a man named Jan Hartson, and me. I first met Mr. Hartson just about a year ago in um, Las Vegas at a MUFON symposium in July. And at that time, uh, meeting him for the first time, introducing myself and asking him about the Meyer case, I may have mentioned this before in another show, he said, we know it's true, it's just too good. Well, it turned out that Jan Hartson had first been introduced to the Meyer case himself about 25 years ago. So a bit, you know, later than I had, but um, 10 years difference, he, he found the same material. Most of it that was available at the time he was finding it was the same stuff that I was having access to. And of course it grew for both of us, but his life took him in a different path where he, he didn't spend any significant time investigating the Meyer case. As of this recording, and as a matter of fact, as of just earlier today, I, we have had, let's see, three, four different conversations, uh, close to about two and a half hours of time. And from those conversations, an agreement was formed and forged between us so that MUFON would participate in an examination. You can call it investigation, open discovery, whatever, exploration, whatever you like of the Meyer case, and it would do so by inviting and allowing its members and anybody worldwide to participate, to ask, to question, to challenge, to object to any and everything about, in, contained therein, the Meyer case. And I pledged that I would answer any and all questions, objections, challenges, uh, you know, recipes, whatever, um, to the best of my ability, openly, honestly, and quite courteously. Because I have, of course, been a bit of a troublemaker and done whatever I could to get that door to be answered. Now that we've had, not only the door has been answered, but we've set up by having it more or less myself uh, alone today, we are figuratively having tea together. So, where we stand now is, as of today, Jan uh, is preparing, he's working with MUFON to get a presence on their website, whereby it can be a focal point for the MUFON members, certainly, and maybe others, to bring their questions, to have me uh, put responses up. I, of course, am already doing that type of thing on my blog. Uh, we already have one interaction with a MUFON you know, state director who uh, wanted to you know, get some photographic evidence of the extraterrestrials. And strangely enough, in this case, there are some photos. It's just that they're just short of what's going to satisfy you completely if you want to see somebody's face. You see the body, the arm, the hand, and a very interesting weapon being held 
by a woman. Naturally, these photos have driven people crazy. And they, why can't we see the woman's face? It looks like it must be a toy. Anybody could get that at a sporting goods store or a toy shop. Well, it turns out that nobody ever could find that weapon. And it was available in no toy catalogs, in no toy stores anywhere in Switzerland, let alone the U.S. or anywhere else. Yeah, it looks very similar to some of the uh, toy ray gun type things that were made in this country some years ago, and maybe some of the ones that are still offered. There's so much here, you know, so I almost don't know where I'm going to want to take you with this because it's so evidence rich. So what I think I'm going to do is continue this whole thing on the evidence and move on and and the photos and what else I've posted on that. But I'm going to first ask that we take a, a few seconds for a break here and I'll be right back with you. Established over 100 years ago, Watkins Books is one of the world's oldest and leading independent bookshops specializing in esoterica. We have the widest selection of esoteric books in the UK, and our friendly and knowledgeable staff are here to assist you in a unique ambience of our shop. So come and visit us in the heart of London as we're open every day. Hi, okay, we're back with this whole thing about move on to Billy Meyer, UFO case, contentiousness, criteria, standards, evidence, the reality and truth about UFOs. Okay, so now that we have this new alliance and we're, we're trying, it's a delicate thing. You know, you, you want to forge alliances with people. My goal is never to really want to create uh, dissension and contentiousness and all of that, but sometimes the o online world, you know, virtual internet relationships, it leads to that all too frequently. My personal mission in life is pretty much about proving the prophecies wrong. The prophecies in this case, I've touched on a little bit before in other shows, we'll be talking about more and more of it because more of them are always being corroborated. And you need to know that because that's actually the higher standard of proof, in this case, the scientific information. But we're going to come back to also this type of evidence. And there is science here that can be applied to this clearly. Now, some of it is, you know, admittedly a little more difficult to, to make a, uh, you know, draw a conclusion on firmly this is authentically extraterrestrial nature, what have you. But when you start to bring together all of the elements, we spoke about menus, there's many menus here, elements of evidence, and you put them all on the table, You've, you start to see that there's a preponderance of evidence. Not anecdotal. And you could have seen a light in the sky, you could have seen a UFO, and it could have been secret military, or it could have been extraterrestrial, but you can't come away with anything that you can put on the table. You can't run that as a, you know, through a scientific protocol and, and come away with a firm, hard conclusion that's going to hold up, this was the sighting of an extraterrestrial craft. There's no way to do that. Even with Meyer stuff, it becomes, it, well, I'd say in the beginning, it's harder to draw that conclusion. People think hoax and all the rest. And remember, I've talked about evidence here, new analyses, at least previously I've mentioned, all of this is going to be coming into play, especially with this new alliance with the MUFON organization. We are our own, you know, individual entities. We're, we're not here to 
you know, to blend into one thing and it's all about UFOs. We're here to find out what the truth is, and especially about this Meyer case. So, with this thing of putting all of the evidence on the table and a preponderance of evidence, with MUFON, when this uh, request came for photographs of extraterrestrials, and I sent these, you know, several photos of the woman with the ray gun, I sent a photo, plus I sent links to everything too, just so you know, where Meyer shot holes through two different trees using this alleged weapon. Here's the kicker. The holes through the trees were oval. If you can drill an oval hole and have the internal surface of that smooth as glass, because when Meyer shot these weapons through the trees, the laser, the heat of that laser seared all of that sap and material in there into a smooth glass-like inner surface. If you can do that with a drill bit, you're probably in for some really, you know, uh, have your own reality show. Everybody wants that, I guess. But the fact is that Meyer not only shot oval holes through these trees, not only were they smooth as glass inside, not only was, were they singed all around the orifice, darkened from the heat, but when you went into the forest, twigs had been shot through, all in a straight line. The investigators went and they actually took a string, tied it around the tree, through the hole, drove through the forest, and sure enough, in a straight line, everything singed, not only singed, some of these branches, and I put up one of the photos with links to other ones, you see these branches have been just whoosh, practically vaporized away from each other, singed to white ash at the ends, darker. To, it, it's pretty amazing stuff. Now, you can't do this with a blowtorch. You can't, you can't do the, the, the oval holes through two trees with a blowtorch and all the rest of this stuff. But people have to think it through. It's part of the preponderance of the evidence. And then in response to my friend, at MUFON, what did I send him? I sent him photographs of the car hood with the seven-fingered handprints, in some cases all the way up to the elbow, the seven-fingered handprints that are virtually etched into the surface, the finish of these cars. I was this close to it. I arranged for the, the crew from WAG TV in London uh, I think the guy's name was Stephen Cook or something like this, to come and bring his crew to interview Billy. It wasn't until, and he was going to do 10 minutes with Billy, two hours later, somebody said, hey, Billy, why don't you show them the, uh, the, the handprints? And Billy goes, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go look. So the handprints, this is a fascinating thing. On the hood, primarily, of, uh, maybe you call it the bonnet, of... Uh, one of the cars that belonged to one of Meyer's stepsons, Silver Subaru, etched into the surface are these seven-fingered handprints, and as I say, in some cases, all the way the arms as well. And you can see all the papillary lines. You, you see the, the fingerprints, the handprints, all the stuff etched in. Those prints had been there for at least one year by the time we went out to check it. They remained for several years, and more than one car has had these handprints. And when I was there last year, I think it was a Volvo station wagon, I saw the handprints on fairly recent. What's the story with the handprints? Well, there is a race called the Trelaner, if I'm getting it right. And they're short-statured uh, human beings, but they are slightly greenish tinge. You know, it's not the little green men from Mars thing, but a slightly greenish tinge. And they happen to have seven fingers. Otherwise, apparently very much... Uh, very similar to us, but there is one distinct chemical difference, and that is that their body chemistry, their secretions, are for our world, for our chemistry, uh, corrosive for many of the things. And in fact, Meyer was introduced on board the great spacer of Ptah, the big ship, was introduced to one of the Trilaner, one of the ones who would ultimately come and play this little joke on them at the center. And he was going to shake hands, and, and Patas said, Billy, I, I advise you not to do that. There's a difference in the body chemistry here. It wouldn't be enjoyable. And Billy says, well, what if we just touch the fingertips? I guess it's kind of like the ET phone home thing. And he says, well, that is okay. Go ahead. And, and Billy wrote that if for about a week his fingertip burned. So we come fast forward to this whole thing with um, the, the tree liner. 
come there one night. They, they kind of have the night watch for the play Iron at one point, and they decide to leave, uh, you know, uh, some mementos or souvenirs for everybody at the center. And th as I say, those prints survived at least four years. I remember coming back and forth, and they were still embedded in those car surfaces. That means that this wasn't something where somebody went and painted something on or, or you know, was, was playing some kind of game. This is, even they did some on the side panels of the car too. So you've got this bizarre stuff where we're kind of being playfully teased by some folks saying, well, you don't think we exist, but maybe we do, and we're not here to do you any harm, and we're not the, you know, all of this mythical, evil, bug-eyed little gray aliens that came as a result of the Roswell crash, these androids that were discovered there, this got institutionalized as the evil gray aliens. So the UFO community chases lights in the sky and reports of people being abducted, deducted, whatever, by evil bug-eyed gray aliens. There's an explanation for that. We're not going to touch into that right now, except to say that extraterrestrials are not abducting us. We haven't even established that extraterrestrials exist, aliens exist, and there's a whole industry about alien abductions. So maybe you could see how it's possible if someone is working with a body of information like the Meyer case for 35 years, half their life, like I am, that when you get all this other stuff for which there's zero hard evidence, and you're trying to bring the Meyer case to a place where it can be explored, critically explored, scientists, skeptics, and the almighty UFO community can come at it, pose their questions, and see if they can be answered logically, credibly, and if when you weigh all factors together, what conclusions do reasonable people then come up with when they are looking at the criteria that reasonable people use to determine the truth. My opinion is that it is inevitable, irrepressible, and whatever other ear or un you want to throw in there, that in time, the reality of the Meyer case will be accepted virtually universally. How f quickly we can get to that place as a world community is another matter. But this is why when I come back to if there really are extraterrestrial contacts, there's got to be a reason for them. If we zoom in to the Meyer case, we find out that as far back as 1951, as you may know from previous presentations, Billy Meyer was publishing warnings in the form of prophecies and predictions from the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, 80s on, warning about the very dangers, the, the, the critical situations that we are and have been observing and experiencing and are now in the midst of a period of ever unfolding circumstances, we can say disasters environmentally, socially, politically, related, whatever you want to categorize it as, we're in it. We wouldn't have had to be in it up to our proverbial necks, ears, earballs, eyeballs, whatever, had this information not been suppressed. It is because the intelligence communities, primarily starting with the U.S., decided to protect people from the truth of the existence of extraterrestrials, and I don't mean evil, gray, bug-eyed aliens, but benevolent, non-harmful, you get me, drifter, extraterrestrial human beings who would like to see us not blow ourselves off the face of the earth, had those decisions not been made, had they not contributed to infantile, I would, I'm not pronouncing it right, infantilizing people with all of this entertainment disinformation where it's merely now fear and amusement and video games and endless prattling on about UFO cases that have nothing left to them. Had that not been set in motion, cultivated, and been successfully you know, promulgated, we'd be so much farther ahead in our world, we might have avoided many of the environmental disasters. 
we would have gotten off of oil and gas extraction and a lot of the mining that so severely damages our world and that is responsible in large part for the increase in, in frequency and intensity of earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, sinkholes. We would have ceased to cut down our forests so irresponsibly. We would have avoided those factors that contribute to increasing the intensity and frequency of all forms of storm, blizzard, hurricanes, tsunamis, you name it, including the global warming and climate change, the increased swings in intensity between the hot and the cold, which fluctuate normally but now are thrown off completely. Global warming, as Meyer first warned about it, 1958, also includes the, the coming of an ice age. You're going to throw off the entire patterns of the planet through irresponsible man-made activities. Wow, who wants to hear all this stuff? Ah, this is where we're coming into the difference between distraction and amusement and chasing lights in the sky and dealing with what will, I think, satisfactorily be accepted as the only scientifically proven, still ongoing UFO contact case in human history, and thereby the most important story in all of science and human history. So I'm going to update you through video and on my website, on my blog, about the progress with MUFON. And this is an invitation to you, at whatever point you see this, to offer your own questions and challenges, objections, whatever, about the Meyer case and its evidence. Give me the opportunity to give you my response. Then, like a good detective, not just somebody online who searches because you now have a computer and it's easy to do it, but like a good detective, you have to start to think. Means, motive, opportunity, preponderance of evidence, all of these factors come into play. And we're going to be revisiting with Billy Meyer case regularly. So with that, I leave you for today, and I wish you a very pleasant time.